Father, we come today and we do thank you and we praise you this morning. We just ask you to continue to be with us, continue to help us. Father, continue to guide us and, and, and just, to, just lead us in every direction that you want us to go, Father. We know, Father, still that there are many that are on our hearts today, Father. Many that are sick, Father. Many that are suffering today. And we ask you today to touch them and help them today, Father. We ask for a healing in this place today, Father. And we just ask that you be with each and every person that's here in this house. And, and, and we just ask that you help us and just guide us and open our eyes, open our ears today. Help us not only to lift up one another, but to, but to be lifted up by you and your word. And we thank you today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, the privileges and blessings that we have in association together in the church of Jesus Christ are very sacred and precious. There is in it such hallowed fellowship as cannot otherwise be known. There is such helpfulness with brotherly watch, care, and counsel as can be found only in the church. There is the godly care of pastors with the teaching of the word and the helpful inspiration of social worship. And there is cooperation and service, accomplishing that which cannot otherwise be done. These are this, the doctrines upon which the church rests are essential to Christian experience and are brief. We believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We especially emphasize the deity of Jesus Christ and the personality of the Holy Spirit. We believe in that human beings are born in sin, that they need work of forgiveness through Christ and the new birth by the Holy Spirit. That subsequent to this, there is a deeper work of heart cleansing or entire sanctification through the infilling of the Holy Spirit and that each of us or each of these works of grace, the Holy Spirit gives witness. We believe that our Lord will return, that the dead shall be raised, and that all shall come to final judgment with its reward and punishment. Church, I ask you, do you heartily believe these truths? If so, answer, we do. Gene, Angie, do you heartily believe these truths? If so, answer, I do. Oh. I do. <laughs> Almost like getting married. <laughs> Doing that. I was right up here when I got married. Yeah, there you go. You're going to be marrying us again. We're standing right here. All right, well, we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> we have to move a tent out of the way, maybe. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> oh, church, do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and do you realize that he saves you now? If so, answer, we do. Yeah. Angie, Jean. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and do you realize that He saves you now? If so, answer, I do. I do. <clears throat> and desiring to unite with the Church of the Nazarene, do you covenant to give yourself to the fellowship and the work of God in connection with it as set forth in the covenant of Christian character and the covenant of Christian conduct of the Church of the Nazarene? If so, answer, I will. I will. All right. Also, finally, Will you endeavor in every way to glorify God by a humble walk, godly conversation, and holy service, by devotedly giving of your means, by faithful attendance upon the means of grace, and by abstaining from all evil? Will you seek earnestly to perfect holiness of heart and life in the fear of the Lord? If so, answer, I will. I will. All right. And with that, I welcome you into this church, its sacred fellowship, responsibilities, and privileges. May the great head of the church bless and keep you and enable you to be faithful in all good works that your life and witness may be effective in leading others to Christ. Amen. And here are some certificates. And there you all go. And then now, everyone, gather around and welcome them. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up. When a cloud of billows you are tempted tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessing, name them one by one. Count your blessing, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count 
your many blessings, see what God has done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the day goes by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his well untold. Count your many blessings your money cannot buy, your reward in heaven or your home on high. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to the gurney's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Amen. I'd be counting all day. Praise God. Okay, if you if you would turn to four thirty nine. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are dreary and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Troubled so the Savior can see every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. I'm now away from all and I Can it really, really be so bad? I'm afraid to be alone 
I'm just a little homesick. That's what this funny feeling is. I'm thinking about a place called home. That's where I really want to go. I'm ready now to go. I'm older now, it's plain to see This world's been so blessed to me There's not a lot that makes me wanna stay I'm making plans to move someday My Savior is who I wanna see Family's there to welcome me. Just a few more miles to go until I make it home. But I'm just a little homesick. I'm just a little homesick. That's what this funny feeling. I'm thinking about a place called home That's where I really want to go I'm ready now to go back home My Savior comes and takes me home To the place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick I'm just a little homesick That's what this funny feeling is I'm thinking about a place called home That's where I really want to go I'm ready now to go back home My Savior comes and takes me home To the place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick To the place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love Sinners was slain So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling someday for a crown oh the old rug 
crooked cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown in the old rugged cross stained with the blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see for twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trope is at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown yes to the old cross I will live ver be true his shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to our home far away where his glory Ever will share. Praise God. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trope is at last I lay down. I will claim. To the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange. Someday for a crown. Yes, amen. Amen. All right. Well, turn to your Bibles to Matthew 22. We're going to be looking um, at our little journey through Matthew. I don't guess it's a little journey. We've been we've been on this journey for quite a while, haven't we? Uh, but we're going to keep going. We're almost done. So uh, another 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 couple of years, and we'll have it licked. So. <laughs> <laughs> but now this morning we are going to just continue on and we are actually in our scripture this morning we're going to skip forward just a little bit in time um, because 
basically the the parts that that I'm that I'm going to pass over or or I'm not really passing over I'm just going to give you a synopsis of them and the reason is because they involve pretty much the same kind of things that we've been talking about time and time and time again and remember last week we finished up with this um, initial kind of confrontation that Jesus is having with these Jews and it was about all about the marriage supper of the Lamb and, and entrance into the kingdom of heaven and, and, wh and what it's going to take to get into the kingdom of heaven and he's telling uh, these Pharisees and these Sadducees uh, pretty much they ain't going to make it. They're not going to get there. They're not going to be among the ones that make it into the kingdom of heaven and, and it was all because of their unwillingness to repent. They had an absolute unwillingness to humble themselves before God and to repent of their sin. And that was the reason why they weren't going to make it in. And it's, it was their refusal to actually believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And we see people every day, uh, Brother Dale was talking about what, what, what you're going to see when you leave this world. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are going to leave this world and the very first thing they're going to see are the gates of hell. Because they refused to repent. They refused to believe. They refused to give their heart to Christ. They just absolutely refused to it. They were too proud like the Pharisees. They were too powerful like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had too much they thought to lose. And really they lost everything. And they were upset with Jesus. They were mad at Jesus. In fact, one of the reoccurring themes in Matthew 21, 45 says, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard that Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. There was no doubt that he was directing this directly at them. There, there should be no doubt when we hear God speaking to us, when we feel the Holy Spirit tugging at our heart, there is no doubt that God's speaking to us. That God's talking to us. That what's being said is about us. There's no, no, no point in denying it. It is what it is. But it says they look for a way to arrest him. Constantly looking for a way to arrest him. And when they arrested him, they wanted him dead. It wasn't just good enough to arrest him and cast him out somewhere. They wanted him dead. And it says they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. So that kind of held them at bay for a little while, but we're going to find out a little bit later it didn't hold them at bay for long, that they moved on with their plans. And the thing that I think most people struggle with is pride, too proud too caught up in all the things and all the ways of the world, too proud to admit that you can't save yourself, that you can't do this on your own, that you can't make it without God. Too proud to admit that. And it's sad, and that's what they had going on. That was their, their problem. And then they're, they're going to lay a couple of plots, a couple of traps for Jesus. The first one we find in the uh, verses 15 through 17 in chapter 22. It says, Then the Pharisees... So they're going to give it a try here. <clears throat> it says, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, We know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Trying to butter him up a little bit. He says, Tell us then, what's your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And what they're trying to play on here is Jesus in this. All this he had been talking about being the Messiah, meaning he was the king, meaning he was the one that was going to set up his kingdom. And, and in their mind and in their thinking, this kingdom is an earthly kingdom. And if you're a king, you don't pay taxes to anybody. You don't pay tribute to anybody else. It's your kingdom. They didn't understand that his kingdom is not of this world. And, and, and that his standards are completely different than what they're talking about. So they're saying... Should, we, should you pay taxes to Caesar? And, and this was more than just um, um, tax evasion. You know, in our country today, if you don't pay your taxes, they'll come get you. You'll pay your taxes one way or another. They will eventually catch up to you. But see, in their day, not paying your taxes is an act of treason. And treason gets you what, you think? Death. So they were going to get Jesus to either admit, one, he's lying about being the Messiah, or they're going to get him to say, well, I'm a king and I don't, I don't have to pay that. Either way, they've got him, they think. And Jesus tells them this. He says, Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites. Well, he didn't mince any words, did he? 
You bunch of hypocrites. He says, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying taxes. And they brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose portrait is on this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left and went away. I mean, it's really no different. We worry so much. I'm, I, yeah, I, I'll tell you, people try everywhere in the world to, to not pay the government anything, which is probably a good thing because they waste everything you give them. But whose picture's on it? Whose picture's on a dollar bill? Yeah, dead presidents mostly. <laughs> it don't matter. It don't matter. It's just money. It don't matter. If you're doing what God tells you to do, He'll take care of it. He'll take care of you. But He's saying, Ah, Caesar, give it to Him. None of that matters to God. None of that matters to His kingdom. None of that matters to Jesus. And it says, They were amazed. And they left Him and they went away. But they didn't stay gone for long. It says, That same day the Sadducees, they're going to give it a shot. Now the Pharisees failed, so the Sadducees. It says the same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. And that was the, their, their main problem is they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Just think how hopeless we would be if we didn't believe in resurrection of the dead. Just think how hopeless that is. And it, you know, Brother Larry, he always makes a little joke. He said, that's why they're sad, you see. That's why they're called Sadducees. They're sad, you see, because they don't believe. They have no hope. And he says, Teacher, they said, Moses told us if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third brother, and right on down to the seventh. And finally the woman died. I guess she got tired of putting up with all the men. <laughs> She's not done. It says, Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? of the seven, since all of them were married to her. See, they're just trying to confuse it. Number one, they say we don't believe in the resurrection, but now they're going to talk about the resurrection. And they're pulling out of Jewish tradition, and their tradition was this. If, if, if you got married and you died, um, you're, uh, and, you, and you had no children, no heirs, you're, you're the next brother in line was obligated to marry your wife, had children, so that you would have heirs. And now they're saying, well, th they went through this thing seven times. Now when the, when the resurrection comes, when we all get to heaven, whose wife will she be? How are they going to divide her up? She probably don't want none of them, but... But again, Jesus is talking about a different, a different realm. Things in heaven don't work like things here on earth. Do we realize that? Heaven is not just a copy of the earth. God's law is not a copy of man's law. Man's law is completely flawed. God's law is completely different. So Jesus says, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. He's telling them, these experts in the scriptures, you don't even know your own scripture, he's saying. He says, at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Think about that. He says, they will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection, he said, well, we're going, since we're talking about the resurrection, let's talk about it. He says, um, but the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. That's why through Jesus we have eternal life because God is not the God of something that's dead and gone. He is the God of living. God created life. God and death is an, uh, it was a consequence of us messing up life. But God created life and God's intention was for us to live forever with Him. Think about that. That's hope. He says He is God of life, not God of death. Because death is hopeless. And He says, and when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at the teaching. So, hmm, He's got the Pharisees, and now he's got the Sadducees. And I guess now they're all sad. So, now, what are they going to do? Are they just going to give up and go home? No, no, no. 
They get together. It says in verse 34, this is where our text picks up. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. Consulted with the Sadducees, this is mainly the Pharisees getting together, saying, all right, we tried this. Our brothers, the Sadducees, they tried this. Let's come up with something. It says one of them, an expert in the law. Everybody's an expert, ain't they? Woo, you can tell people. You can tell people about Jesus, and you're going to have all kinds of experts. They're going to tell you everything that they know or that they think they know about the Bible, even things that aren't in there. It says, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Oh, here we go. The greatest commandment of the law. And they're talking about the Ten Commandments here. God's law that he gave down to Moses. He says, Jesus replied. That's easy. Jesus replied. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Think about that. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says all the law, all the prophets hang on these two commandments. This should be what every single church that calls himself a church should live by. This should be what, if you're going to say, what's it mean to be a Christian? Well, first it means repentance, but it also means loving God with all of your being, demonstrating that love by loving other people. And Jesus says, these are the greatest commandments. But we don't follow them. We're going to find ways around them. And this kind of stumps them. This kind of confuses them. Because, and this kind of offends them. And what they're trying to do when they get together to do this, they're trying to get Jesus to say that one of God's commandments is more important than the other ones. That, it's a, that this one's important or that one's important. And, if you're, and these are God's basic tenets of faith that he says every single person that wants to enter his kingdom must follow. And for Jesus to say one is more important than the other, blasphemy. They got him again. No. Jesus tells them some commandments that they, uh, well, they have heard time and time again. If, uh, you know, this isn't new. This is something that is actually recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. I believe it's in Exodus, and that may even be in the book of Numbers. But Jesus tells them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. And it's, it's almost, it's very similar to, um, to the commandment, put no other gods before me. Put God first in everything. Love God with everything. And see, what they're trying to do here, they're trying to do something that's really stupid. Jesus is the Logos. He is the Word. Meaning that anything that proceeds out of the mouth of God, guess who wrote it? Guess who spoke it? It was Jesus. He's the Word. And they're trying to tell the author of the Ten Commandments to pick and choose which one's the best or to, or to, or to rank them and rate them. You know, and we do that too. We do that too. This sin's worse than this sin. This sin's, oh, well, we can get away with that. Oh, we better not do that. That's bad. That's bad. But see, we look at things through human eyes, through human terms. And that's not how God looks at it. All sin is bad. There's no such thing as a big lie and a little lie. It's a lie. Just like there's no such thing as a little bit of adultery or a lot of adultery. It's all adultery. There's no such thing as a little killing or a lot of killing. The person's still dead. Now, I used to have a friend that was a, a police officer. I won't tell you what agency he worked for, but he always said when he went to a murder scene... One of his first questions was, well, did they, did they deserve to die? <laughs> and that framed how he investigated it. I was like, well, okay, but killing's killing. <laughs> it don't make no difference. Killing is killing. Sin is sin. And 
The law is the law. And the thing about commandments, see, things, commandments, commandments are not just good ideas. They're not just something, well, we'll think about it. Well, we need to consider it. Well, maybe a commandment, God said, you must do this. In the entire, in, in, in Sunday school for the last several weeks, you've all been talking about all the different sacrifices and all the different requirements and what they stood for and all this and that, everything. And, and the thing about those, those things are temporary. Jesus is permanent. And the things about all the sin that there's a cover and all of this and that and everything. Because the reason we did it is, and the reason we continue to do it is we cannot do this on our own. We can't fulfill the Ten Commandments on our own. Now we may do good with one, two, three, four, five, or six of them. But there's always one or two that we, can, we can't do it. When it always sticks out is to honor your father and your mother and you'll have a long life. That's a commandment. It don't mean honor them when you're just a kid, when you get to be grown, do whatever you want. It says honor them. Honor them. Think about it. But see, we can't do that. The Jews couldn't do that. So you know what they did? They had to sacrifice. Well, Jesus came and Jesus is the sacrifice. And, but these are things that have to happen. And he tells them, well, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. He says this is the first and greatest commandment. And you notice it doesn't say serve God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. It doesn't say, even say obey God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. It says, love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. You know why it says that? Because if you love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, you will obey God. You will serve God. Because God is not interested in a bunch of little robots running around doing things because they're afraid of God or, or because they think they're obligated to do these things. Everything that we should do, regardless of what it is, should flow from love, our love for God. And see, if we love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, those things will just naturally happen. And the second one, when he, when he said, love your neighbor as yourself, well, that's just a manifestation of loving God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind. If you love God with all of your being, you're naturally going to love your neighbor. And it don't say, oh, well, kind of, sort of, most of the time. It says, love your neighbor, love other people. And it all floats from love. And when we mess up, we, we get in this mindset that we're obligated. We think that everything about Christianity, everything about church, everything about serving God, obeying God is just a checklist. Check, 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 check. Check it off the list, we're good. We can't check it off the list, we're not good. We need to go back and check some things off the list. It's not how it works. You see, you love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. You hear what God speaks to you and you respond out of that. Because you love God, you respect God, you want to honor God. Not because it's a chore or a job that you have to do. That you have to do. You know, I really think yesterday when all these people were here working, people was working hard. But people were smiling. People were having a good time. People were even bringing me snacks to every, every hour. And I was smiling and having a good time too. But, and see, that's the thing. Even though it's work, when you do it from out of a love, yeah, it's work, yeah, it's hard work. Yeah, you may even complain about it a little bit. But you do it because you want to, not because you got to. It's everything in life. That's the way God wants it. And really what it boils down to is ask yourself, why do I obey God? Why do I serve God? Ask yourself that. It's because you truly love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul? Or is it because you feel obligated, feel like you have to? Because if that's how you feel, then you need to do some work on God's altar. God needs to get a hold of your heart. God needs to change that heart. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we have a bad day or we can't, can't ever have a bad day or we don't ever have a bad attitude because we're human beings. But I'm talking about in general, how do you feel about humanity? Are you upset when bad things happen in this world? Does it break your heart when you see people suffering? Or do you say, well, I'm glad it ain't me. And there's people out there like that. Think about it. There are. How do you... How does life impact you? Because that's really what matters. And the reason Jesus made these two commandments the greatest is because if you can follow those two, you got the other, those ten licked. you got to work out. And God will work it out. So stand with me. Do you all care to come and get us a song together if you can? I want you all to think about that this morning. Think about your Christian life. Think about how you serve God. Think about how you love God. Do you love God? And I'm sure everybody will say, well, yeah, I love God. Do you really? Do you really? Or have you just heard for so many years and months and 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 all the things about obligation or about dedication or about this or that. We think, oh, I better do that. I have to do that. I'm going to tell you something. Not a single one of y'all had to come here this morning. I hope you came because you wanted to. I hope that's why you came. But if you felt like you came because you had to, I ain't going to come to your house and track you down. But why don't you ask God to speak to your heart, to speak to your soul, to soften that heart a little bit. If you pray because you think you have to pray, and I'm not talking about have to because it helps you. I'm talking about have to because well, they say, i got to pray, so I better go pray. I mean, you ain't praying. You're just wasting your time. You read your Bible because oh, I got to read my Bible because they told me I had to. You're wasting your time. If you come down and pray just because you think, well, so I better go down there and pray because so everybody will see me. You're wasting your time. Everything should be motivated by a love for God. So what motivates you this morning? If you need to come and pray, come and pray. I'm going to hush now. We come today. We thank you for this day. We thank you for blessing us and being with us and helping us. Father, we know that you can move and you will move, Father, in every situation. And we ask you to keep us safe and just help.